fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the House of Mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Nerd on KCB. 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. And of course, I'm Al Warren on the west side and on the east side of the country. We've got Mr. David Martino. I am here. You're here. Okay. <laughs> I'm here. We're, we're all excited today. So, ready to rock. Ready to rock. We've got a uh, great author, you know, from the UK uh, calling in on the mm-hmm. line. So we'll get right to him. And, and uh, we're going to talk about his new book. Um, he's... Primarily, I guess, a historical fiction author, but we'll find out more. So, Mr. Rory Clemens, thank you for being here. Uh, thanks for having me, Al. Nice to meet you. Yeah, it's, it's a pleasure. Um, now, before we get into your new book, uh, it's called A Prince and a Spy. Let's talk about some of your history, some of your background. Um, um, when did you decide that you wanted to be a writer? I, I've wanted to be a writer all my life, but I had to earn a living. Uh, as uh, when I was uh, set out after you know after uh, my education, and I became a journalist. I, you know, back in those days, there didn't seem to be many creative writing courses around. So I thought, how do I learn to be a writer? I'll go and become a journalist, and so that's what I did for a while. And uh, all the while, I was trying to write books, and it's quite difficult to write books when you're doing it part time. But you know, I had a few which I would hate to see the light of day because they're pretty bad but all the time i was learning i was learning my craft yeah yeah i think we all go through that you know uh you know you get better each book so um now now you you're doing historical fiction what i find interesting is if uh, being a journalist but you are writing the truth um but when you get into historical fiction does sometimes the truth get in the way no because i you know i use real events in my stories and I use real characters but I also use fictional characters so uh, it doesn't get in the way it helps me you know I think of uh, uh, you know this book is is about the death of Prince George the Duke of Kent so I said well what really might have happened and that sets my fevered brain working and I come up with a with an idea of what might have happened and weaves the story around it yeah, it's an interesting story. I love the uh, the Nazi time period and uh, all the different things that are that. I you know I don't know if we'll ever know all the real historical aspects of the little details that went on between a lot of these different uh, um, characters, as we call them, people that, that were involved. Um, how much do we know about the people involved here? So, like Prince George, um, the brother of the King of England. Well, he, he was uh, a fascinating character. You know, he was uh, he was a very handsome man. He was he was you know, I guess he would have been a bit like you know the, the Prince Harry of, uh, of his day. But he, he led a quite racy life. I mean, I'm not saying Prince Harry was like him in, in, in that way, but that he was very glamorous. That was the point. And he he had been a high in high society during the twenties. He led a led a very scandalous life in the, in those sort of days. He'd had a long-term relationship with uh, uh, a lady called Kiki Preston, who was a drug addict and was very, uh, uh, very sort of uh, notorious at the time. He'd also had affairs with men, uh, including probably Noel Coward. And he, uh, you know, eventually settled down with Princess Marina of Greece and became... Uh, very respectable and a very, uh, you know, well thought of member of the royal family and of British society. Oh, so 
What did the royal family think of him but by, by being so scandalous, you know, uh, uh, fooling around with men, women, and doing all these wild things and uh, an affair with a drug addict? Uh, did the royal family try to straighten him out or change him? I, d- I don't know whether it, whether it was the royal family straightening himself him out or whether he straightened himself out. I guess his, I think his father, uh, George V, was a bit straight laced than his wife was, so they might have disapproved. But uh, I haven't got any quotes to that effect from them. So, in in those days, the uh, the royal family were much less involved with. Uh, the press, shall we say? So they didn't, they didn't spend to tend to uh, let their feelings be known. But I could imagine they were a bit, uh, they did find it a bit difficult, and were keen to get him married and settle down. Yeah. What, what was he? So was he popular in the country? Did the people like him? I, th- I think he was very popular. Yeah, I think he was, and he, uh, uh, yeah, he, he was, uh, you know, he was in the sort of society pages. As I said he was a very good-looking guy. And he uh, w- would have been in the, all the big clubs in London at the, and at the big events. And and then as a, when he settled down, he became a sort of envoy without, you know, any sort of title to go with it, except that he was, you know, a, a senior royal. And he was sent off to negotiate with Salazar of Portugal to keep Salazar out of the war. Then he was sent off to America to converse with... Roosevelt and they hit up, hit it off immediately. They they really did like each other, and he helped persuade Roosevelt to support England. He helped to persuade Roosevelt that England wasn't about to be defeated by the Nazis and they deserved the support for America. And he uh, helped set up the you know the lend lease uh, system whereby we got a lot of ships and planes from America, which helped us uh, you know keep the Nazis from the door and you know he was uh, uh, he, he got uh, Roosevelt to be godfather to his uh, his little boy uh, he's still alive there actually he's called Prince Michael of Kent the, uh, the son who was uh, Roosevelt's da- uh, godfather wow how was he set up here now so you you sort of have this um, scenario with uh, him and one of his cousins from Germany Prince Philip now uh, tell us a little bit about Philip Philip had a similar background to uh, his English cousin, uh, Prince George, Duke of Kent. Uh, but Prince Philip had also had a very sort of racy uh, young, younger days and uh, was involved with men, uh, including the poet Siegfried Sassoon. Uh, he, uh, uh, but he was married uh, by the time of the war. Uh, he was uh, married to... Uh, Prince Mafalda of Italy, the daughter of the King of Italy, and uh, he had become very close friends with Hitler. Uh, that was largely the doing of Go- Goebbels, who met uh, Prince Philip in 1930, about 1930, persuaded Hitler to meet him, and they hit it, up, hit it off, and he immediately joined the Nazi party, and became a close friend and confidant he, he was he said he was said to have been one of the few people who had always had access to hitler and he often dined with him and hitler saw him as a friend which he didn't have actually many friends who weren't political allies but he saw him as a friend somebody he could dine with and uh, chat chat with um yeah so huh. he was uh, he was an interesting character in that Funny enough, you read most of the history books, he gets very little, me- little mention, uh, but he was important in uh, Hitler's world at the time. I wonder how he hit it off with Hitler so well. I wonder why they connected, like on what level, um, what Hitler saw in him that he really liked. I wonder what that was. Um, it could be that you know that he had a bit of an inferiority complex when it came to the aristocracy, Hitler, and was felt maybe flattered that somebody uh, from that those uh, the high aristocracy. You know, he did, Prince Philip was a great uh, grandson of Queen Victoria, as was Prince George of England. Uh, that, it seems possible that he certainly liked living that sort of high life, Hitler, didn't he? He loved going to. By Reut and listening to Wagner and 
hobnobbing it at the opera. You know, he, yeah. he, he liked all that stuff. Maybe it, maybe it felt him built up his self-esteem. I don't know. Yeah, pretty strange. How did, how did Hitler use uh, Prince Philip? Like, was he used in a political way for him? He was. He was. He was, uh, because his, he had strong connections with Italy through his wife. Uh, he was uh, seen as an unofficial negotiator with Mussolini, so he was back and forth with Italy, uh, dealing with uh, the fascists there. Uh, and so he would have been, if he, if as I suggested in my story, he wanted to sound out the English about the possibility of doing a, uh, some sort of treaty and ending the war between the two countries, he's just the sort of guy Hitler would have used. It could have had unofficial, very, very discreet meeting with uh, his English cousin. Because uh, one thing that, that certainly that the British didn't want was anybody to think that they were talking to Nazis. Because our allies were uh, Stalin in Russia and, and, uh, and America, both of whom would have been appalled to think that England was uh, talking to the Nazis at all. Um, now, I'm not saying that that's what happened, but I'm saying this is what could have happened, that there could have been this meeting. Oh, okay. Now, was it a popular idea at the time within England itself, um, within the people, that um, they would rather have uh, some sort of settlement or treaty between the two countries than a war? Is that, is that kind of common? I, I'm not, not sure it had been popular, uh, but I think it was widespread that they thought that there might be a deal done. Because in 1942, England was doing really badly still. You know, we had been bombed badly. All the cities had been bombed. We hadn't had any great victories uh, over the Nazis. The Nazis were still deeply uh, in, 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 uh, it, involved in their war in the East and didn't Although they'd come to sort of a bit of a halt, they hadn't. It didn't look like they were going to be turned around any time soon. And America was just in the war, but uh, their assistance hadn't come through. I mean, for instance, you know, I had the OSS, the uh, Office of Strategic Services, uh, being set up in London in summer of 1942. Well, they were really behind the, at the beginning. They were really uh, slow to get off the ground because they didn't have a, a proper secret service. They had individual secret uh, uh, military intelligence, but they didn't have a, a centralized agency. Uh, I've got to say, they got off the ground very, very quickly uh, once they did get going. And they ended up a fantastic organization. Uh, OSS, known generally as Oh so, oh, so sexy because there was such a glamorous <laughs> bunch, but such a glamorous bunch of guys and girls. <laughs> well, geez, they didn't call me. Well, they didn't call you to. They didn't want you in it. No. I don't know why not. <laughs> well, just, I mean, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> they think I'd be right in there. Geez. Yeah, yeah. you'd think so. Yeah. Well, <laughs> maybe it, maybe maybe you just weren't born in time. Though. <laughs> I guess so. You know, I'm old, but not that old. But <laughs> oh, so. Now, now the premise of this book, in a sense, is that that these two princes meet and are going to, you know, talk around the area of perhaps the countries at a treaty and and all this stuff. But at the same time, um, I guess uh, Winston Churchill probably would have never endorsed such a treaty, would he have? He would never have done it. He 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 had one. One aim in mind that had to be total, unconditional surrender by the Nazis. He had no other, but there were plenty of other people in England who would have been happy to. Uh, don't forget, I mean, we had fascists in this country, we were, and there were fascists in America as well. You know, the the, the Bund, as it was called. But in this country, you know, but in 1939, just before the war started, uh, our fascist leader uh, uh, Oswald Mosley had a, a, a mass rally of. Uh, uh, tens of thousands of people uh, uh, all demanding there be no war with with, uh, with Germany. There was a there was a you know quite a big fascist element here. Mm. How did well, how how do you think Hitler would have been 
with something like that, a treaty. I, I, wouldn't he be sort of the same as as um, Churchill in the way that he wanted to dominate kind of the world? Wasn't that his intention? Yeah, he he always thought he could work with the British. He his idea going back a long way was that he would leave the British Empire intact and he but the British would leave him to rule Europe uh, and yeah he could have gone along with that but he would have been the dominant partner anyway wouldn't he right. uh, because and he might eventually have come to Britain anyway well sorry um, I was I was only joking about letting you get on with your empire I want it <laughs> <laughs> well yeah when you, you know he, he had form in that. He told uh, the Russians he was their pals, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah, even Italy, right? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you could trust him very far, but um, right. well, well, that's really interesting. And so, so um, shortly after this um, meeting in your book, which is your suggestion, but it was shortly after that that Prince George actually died in a plane crash. Um, now he was with other people in that plane crash wasn't there like 12 people or something and one survived or something like that there's there's 15 and officially one survived but you know unofficially there might have been another survivor and there might have been a woman on board that plane now i'm not the first person to suggest that but uh, you know there's a lot of mystery around it because it it was it wasn't it was hushed up, I've got to say. It was hushed up, the, or the whole uh, event. And it, there was no reason for that crash. So you think, was it sabotage? Because the plane was in perfect working order, had three of the top pilots in the country aboard, including the, uh, the Duke himself, who was a seasoned pilot. And, yeah, so there was something very, very fishy about it. Do we know why it crashed? I said, like, have you been there and you sort of seen the area? Was there what? What was the public told? Uh, the reason for the crash was the, uh, the the official reason was pilot error, uh, which was uh, I think might have been a bit of a disgrace because uh, it may not have been pilot error, and I, I'm not sure that it's fair that on that man's memory, the pilot. His name escapes me right at this moment, but it, it that he uh, was blamed for the crash. I mean, he was very, very experienced. It was a very l low hill he crashed into, so there may have been other, there may be another cause which hasn't come out officially, but which I address in A Prince and a Spy. Right, right, and 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 you're not going to tell us because that would be the giveaway, wouldn't it? It might be. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all right. That's all right. I mean, that's uh, that's the secret. That's the intrigue. Um, but you know, it's, it's but there was. Uh, we do know that there was one survivor for sure. Did that survivor ever say anything about the crash or give any he, evidence? He was. He was immediately hushed up. He was quite badly injured, and he was in hospital that day. And that day, two Secret Service uh, men went along to his bedside and made him sign something, which was obviously the official secrets act, and he was told he must never say a word to anybody about him. I don't know how he signed it, actually, because both his, both his arms were burned, and it must be bandaged up, so I don't know what, where, where, what he was holding the pen with. But. Yeah. <laughs> That's another secret you can't tell us. You have to be in the book. Well, you know. Uh, so, but that's interesting. Um, so, would you would you be suggesting then that Prince George was the target on the plane? It wasn't anybody else. Uh, you, no, I'd be suggesting that Prince George was the target. You know, there were if he if if, Jim, if Prince George was talking to the Germans, and I can only believe that if he was talking to the Germans, it's because they wanted the British wanted to know about German morale, not because they had any intention of doing a deal. But if anyone outside for a moment thought that he was talking to them. They would want to. They would want to kill him, because the Stalin definitely wouldn't have wanted England doing a deal with Hitler and freeing up all his divisions from the West to attack him in the East. And nor would, nor would I suggest would have America having you know committed themselves to this war uh, on two fronts, you know, in in the East and in, uh, in against Japan and against Germany. They wouldn't have wanted 
to to think that England was looking at all flaky. Right, right, yeah. So, so there, there's a couple of suspects then, um, and you're not going to tell yeah. us who that is either. Who the winner? Or the other one? <laughs> no, no. And you know, and and but you know, get back to the what Stalin would have thought. Stalin was always paranoid. He was always convinced the British were going to do a deal with the Nazis and pull out the war. And he was that would not have been good for the Soviet Union if that had happened. Mm. So Stalin, Stalin was uh, an interesting character. He he was really um, he didn't really team up with anybody willingly, did he? Uh, no, but he was very glad to. I mean, he teamed up with Hitler willingly before the war and split up Poland. But I guess it, it's funny enough for, for such a paranoid man. It's strange that he hadn't. Uh, hadn't realized that Hitler had no intention of keeping the treaty and hadn't prepared his defenses better because they were taken completely by surprise when the Nazis invaded them in 1941, which is a bit... Yeah. Anyway, I don't know why it, it doesn't sort of ring true. But, you know, he, uh, he, he wanted to... He wanted, certainly wanted to be, during the wartime anyway, to be uh, friends with Britain and America because he wanted the equipment from them, and he wanted them to open up new fronts to take the pressure off the East. Mm. So so what was the overall thought, you know, or after the crash, was, was kind of England and the rest of the world upset about Prince George being killed? Was there kind of a big big funeral and all that, or what, what kind of happened after there, that? It was, it was very, very quiet. Uh, no, no, no state funeral or anything like that. Very little was said about it. Um, you know, they, 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 the royal family weren't going to let anyone think that they thought their loss was any greater than anybody else's because people were dying in great numbers in the bombing and uh, uh, on the battlefield at the time. Um, you know, funny enough, including my own uncle died in, the, uh, in, in a submarine in 1942 about that time. So, you know, families were losing people and the the royal family couldn't be made to think that uh, they thought themselves above the rest of the population. Mm. Also, also, but there was there was a feeling. There always has since then has been a feeling that something was covered up. Yeah, yeah. That I, I, I'd imagine there would have been a. Uh, so, what kind of conspiracies went around then? Did you kind of find out anything about what people were saying, or um, not really? I don't think I think the conspiracy theories have sort of started uh, after the war. I think you know a lot of people grow up not ever having heard of Prince George the Duke of Kent, which you can't imagine now. You know, if the king's brother or the queen's one of the king's uh, the queen's sons died now, you can imagine it'd be world news for weeks on end, wouldn't couldn't it? Wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, and yet very little was made of it. Um, uh, but since then, there have been some quite strange conspiracy theories. One is that he was uh, had a Rudolf Hess aboard, you know, the Hitler's deputy who had fled to England in 1941. And that uh, Rudolf Hess, who, right, who was tried at the Nuremberg trial, was a, uh, a you know, a, a lookalike. It does, I mean, that just simply doesn't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, I mean, well, did Hitler escape? Did he kill himself? Who knows? I've heard Who he's knows? on the moon. <laughs> 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 I've heard all sorts of stuff, right? Who knows, right? But uh, yeah, you, 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 one day we might find out. Maybe, maybe, maybe still alive somewhere. Yeah, I heard that the aliens took him to the dark side of the moon. He's on a base, <laughs> and he's going to come back. But you know, he's going to be pretty old. He's going to be true. pretty old. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's probably he's probably got Stalin and Mao Zedong there with him as yeah. well. <laughs> Elvis Presley's playing music for and, him, and uh, Elvis will be there. <laughs> yeah, it's all there. <laughs> this is um, a book two of of a spy novel you that that series kind of you're doing, right? It it is a, it is part of a series. Yeah, there have been other ones printed in Britain, but they haven't come out in America yet. Okay. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah. who knows? And there's a new one on the way in England in January, so 
hopefully it'll come out in America as well. I think Pegasus has done a great job uh, um, publishing in America. I'm really pleased with it. Yeah. It's a great bunch of guys. Yeah, yeah, they get out there. Um, but now, so you you have a, a character called Professor Tom Wilde in this, right? Yeah. Now he's he's half he's half American and he's half uh, Irish, and he uh, he's he looks upon those sort of slightly effete upper class uh, people who inhabited places like Oxford and Cambridge University in back in those days. You know, you didn't you didn't get into Oxford or Cambridge in those days on how clever you were, is which school you went to. Uh, but they were very good at university at the same time. But they, it was a different world, right. and there weren't many there weren't many women around in those in those. There were sort of like boys clubs. In fact, we, you know, women at Cambridge weren't allowed to get degrees until 1948, which is shocking because actually there were some women. There were two women's colleges, and there were some fantastic women came out of them. Uh, they been, weren't allowed to actually get a degree. However much cleverer than the boys they were. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, they didn't have Oprah back then either, so they, you know, <laughs> they couldn't. Get, they wouldn't get uh, advertised, you know, as much. So, um, no. I, I, but, you know, so how much, um, how much research goes into something like this when you're doing a book like this? How long does it take you to kind of get get it all done? Uh, well, I guess half the time is research, and half the, uh, they are research heavy books. I do, I do like to get my uh, my histor- historical facts as accurate as I possibly can, and uh, so I go to great depths. So I don't just sort of look in Wikipedia and see what's there. I want to. I read around it. I buy, I buy and read hundreds of books, and uh, you know, when necessary, talk to people. You know, uh, who might no uh, you know, expertise. I mean, one of my books was called Nucleus and it involved uh, the splitting of the atom. So I had to sort of make sure I got that uh, that science right. Okay. I, go into, I, go to, I go to I go to I go great lengths of uh, to research. I guess half the time is research, half the time is writing. I like the research, though. So I always like to go to places uh, mentioned in the books when I can get there. It hasn't been easy in the last year. No, I guess not. Do you get something when you go to a location that something happened or a place or a castle or when you're in an area, Does it? do, do you kind of get a feeling for the place and that helps you write it? You do, and sometimes it, sometimes it's what's not there. I mean, you might, you know, if you, I, I went to uh, one of my previous uh, novels. Uh, it's set in the 16th century. I was writing about uh, a battle in Western France, or in in Brittany, and I went I went there just to see this castle which was besieged, and the castle's not there, but I understood the terrain, I and so I understood what had happened, even though nothing existed there anymore. I could find out where it had been, and I, anyway, it gives you. It's always nice to go to places anyway, isn't it? Yeah, it gives oh, yeah. you a good excuse to go. Yeah, it gives you a good excuse to. Okay, then you can always claim it on expenses. I was going to say it's a good write-off. <laughs> it's a good, it's a good, it's a good write-off. You know why not? Go for it. You yeah. know, it, it, I just, I've just, I'm just trying to work out whether Tom Wilde can go to the West Indies in one of my books. <laughs> <laughs> Would you find the time period and the setting uh, actually become a, a character in the book? The, the time period, yeah, I would, yes, I think that's accurate. Um, I think it's a uh, it's a big part of it, and you you've got to get the language right, and you've got to make mm. it uh, of the time. Uh, yeah, it's it, it's a big to me it's a big part of it. The uh, the period it helps in some ways. You know, if you go to historical novels, the technology is pretty straightforward. You know, in the 1930s, 1940s. The only way of communicating really was by telegram or telephone. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, you didn't have. It must get you know. Nowadays, technology is out of date within a year, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. Yeah, yeah. I I, I wonder then. Then what what do you find the biggest challenge to writing a period piece like that? It, the, the the initial. 
thing is getting the language right. You want to, you've got to write it uh, so that it doesn't jar you and say, oh, people didn't speak like that in those days. But at the same time, you've got to have, write it for a modern audience. Uh, it was particularly true, you know, when I, my Tudor novels, you've got to get that. You can't talk in Shakespearean English because nobody was going to read it. Yeah. But you can't, you can't, but you can't write words, modern words, which jar and you think, oh, you know, they wouldn't have, that doesn't sound like a, a Tudor voice. So you've got to make it, you've got to find a fine line of compromise. And it's more subtle probably with the the 1930s. I mean, we all understand what is talked about in the 1930s, but some of the language might have jarred hmm. some of the things that the way they talked. Yeah. I, you know, slang expressions, I guess, things like that, right? You know. Yeah, and and I, there would, I, I mean, I think there would have been far less uh, swearing in those days, far less uh, bad language, wouldn't there? Yeah, it would have been that. You know, there, I mean, it would have obviously it was there, but you know, I don't. You know, my my parents and grandparents, I don't remember them ever using bad language. Yeah. Well, I think I think they wouldn't use it around kids, or you know, mm -hmm. certain. I think there would be a, a little bit of discipline maybe i think that's true yeah and i would never have used it around them because oh no you'd get beat yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> i you know <laughs> it's a free-for-all now but um yeah did you did you come across any anything unexpected like when you're doing research and you're going through and you're reading and you're going to places and stuff like that is there sometimes you come across something that you had no idea happened all, all the time I mean, all, all the time I, I come across things that uh, uh, surprise me. You know, they're just little, little, little uh, vignettes, little, uh, just little details of history. And you find that there actually there are so many different stories. Uh, so many. I mean, from the Second World War, there are so many untold stories. Um, I'm trying to think of one on the top of my head right now, but. All the time, I'm finding things. I mean, just the just the the fact of who we're talking about, uh, you know, Prince Philip von Hessen. Uh, I came across him in a book, and I'd never heard of him. So I looked at, you know, I've got dozens of books about the Nazis, and I found about one or two tiny references to him. And yet, masses have written about Hitler's other friend Speer, but nothing. Almost nothing is written about this man who was actually a very important part of the court of Adolf Hitler. Huh. So that was a surprise to me. I wonder why that something thought, like that happened. I wonder why that would he would be left out like that. I don't know. People just disappear, don't they? Yeah. And he ended up. Uh, he ended up uh, surviving it. He was sent off. You know, he fell from grace, and he was sent off to a concentration camp. And his wife was also sent to a concentration camp. She was killed in an Allied bombing raid uh, before the World War, but he survived and he sort of fell foul of the uh, denazification people. And I think he spent a bit of time in jail, but then spent the rest of his life collecting paintings, traveling back and forth to Italy. Nice, nice. He had a you know a good a good long life. He got away with it. Yeah, I know, and that's I think that, you know that's frustrating for a lot of people. I think that. There were a lot of, actually there there were a lot of uh, the aristocracy in Germany did join the Nazi party is surprising I think uh, a high proportion of them and I think they sort of saw the Nazi party as a bulwark against the communists in the east who were going to come and take their lands away from them and hand it over to the common people and so they saw them they they, they saw the Nazi party as protecting them against communism. Wow. I'm not sure they actually believed in Nazism necessarily, but they, uh, they yeah. thought better, better of two evils, they thought. They weren't... They weren't uh, right. <laughs> they, no, they weren't right. They tended, they tended to lose their lives and their lands in the end anyway, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yourself, do you, do you read a lot of historical fiction? Do you kind of get into some of the authors that do the same type of work or do you stay away from that i read a lot of history i don't read so much historical fiction i mean simply because i don't have much that enough time i have funny enough i'm reading uh, a historical fiction book at the moment it's not a thriller it's uh, 
uh, a gentleman in Moscow, I don't know if you've heard of it, uh, Amor Towels, so I highly recommend it to anyone. It's just a wonderful book about this guy who, uh, this count in, uh, in 1922s who survived the revolution and he's holed up in a hotel. I mean, I, I haven't finished it yet, so I can't tell you what happens, but uh, it's a great, <laughs> great, great read. It's, it's written by an American guy. Yeah, it's really good. Wow, yeah, no, I'll look for it. Um, did you have an inspiration that made you write this book or something that you fell into? To Like, what made you follow this story and, and decide to write a book about it? Um, well, I'm always fascinated by the story. I've known the story of, unlike many people who have never heard of Prince George, the Duke of Kent, uh, I've known about it for a long, long time and fascinated by it. And, you know, as a journalist in the old days, you sort of thinking, what's behind this story? What's behind this story? What's the truth? And, you know, you, uh, you can't write always what you might think have happened as a journalist. But as a fiction writer, you can play with it a bit and you can think, yeah, this could have happened. This makes sense. This is feasible. And uh, that's, that's sort of how it came about. And I sort of put it up to my publisher. They liked the idea. And I went for it. Wow. So um, has the CIA or anybody come after you? Or? <laughs> they haven't caught me yet. <laughs> <laughs> but who knows? Yeah. yeah. They'll be watching yeah. you. Um, now, <laughs> now, Thomas Wilde, um, how do you describe him? Like, who, who inspired you to create that character? Was that it's part of yourself, or was there so, sort of some real figures in the world that you kind of... I guess, uh, I guess, there's, always, I guess there's always a bit of what you'd like to be rather than what you actually are. You know, I, w I would like to be that brave. Uh, I would like to be that useful to the world. Uh, but actually, there were two. He is... Uh, the ins there are two Americans who inspired me. Uh, uh, one was uh, uh, Conyers Reed. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of him. He was uh, uh, an author. He wrote uh, a history of the Tudor spy master Walsingham. He was also studied in England, uh, and he was one of the founders of the OSS. And in fact, he was involved, also involved in the CIA, early CIA. And the other one was James Jesus Angleton, who you may have heard of. He was, he also was involved in, he went to school in England, uh, but he uh, was also one of the, helped set up the CIA and in fact became director of counterintelligence. So it's a couple of Americans who got very strong links with England who inspired me to write, you know, had this American with very strong links to England in Tom Wilde. Um, and both of them, you know, both of them uh, uh, were academics. You know, James Easton Angleton is also a poet as well as a spy. And they, uh, anyway, that's where it came from, that those two guys and uh, probably a bit of me or what I would like to be. <laughs> but I don't. I, I don't. I don't drink as much whiskey as Tom Wilde. Do. I drink uh, a bit more red. A bit more red wine. Me. I can't uh, take the whiskey. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so but yeah, but you're the. You, but the brave parts. That's all you, right? The, the brave. The the wish for the bravery. Because I come from a family of. Uh, you look at my website. You'll see some old pictures of my family who uh, were soldiers. You know, my great grandfather was a soldier. My father. My grandfather was a soldier. And my father was in the navy, as were his two brothers. You know, one of them worked with, was in worked alongside Ian Fleming. You know, the James Bond uh, author in <laughs> naval intelli naval intelligence. So I've got the history there. I just haven't done it myself. I've, I've never been in the military. <laughs> oh, that's pretty funny. So, so uh, what's next? What do you got coming up after this? Uh, the next one uh, in in this uh, series is called the. Uh, the Man in the Bunker, and that's coming out in England in January. Hopefully it will follow soon after in America, but that's for Pegasus to decide, they're my pub American publisher. Um, that's sort of set a little while later than The Prince and the Spy. Um, and I've got to, after that I've got three more books just being commissioned by my English publisher, so hopefully they might... Uh, 
head off to America as well. I've always been hopeful, hope, hope, hope for that. Yeah, yeah, that's always a, always a good thing, you know, get it around and stuff. What, what, what kind of response do you get from people when you actually are, when, when they find out you're researching something like this, especially something with the Nazi time period? I think people are pretty open-minded about it. You know, I, 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 I hope I'm making it clear that it's, uh, this is purely uh, for, for the purposes of a thriller. I'm not going to go in there. Uh, into any sort of discussions with people uh, with any sort of political uh, 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 feeling to it. Is that that's not what I'm about. It's just it, this is me writing uh, as part of the you know uh, as allies versus an evil empire. And uh, you know I think people understand that. And people help me. I get a lot of help from people. You know I get help from. Uh, uh, from, all, from all sides, really. Um, I mean, have, Germans have helped me. Jews have helped me. Uh, people, people are fantastic. You know, they under people want to talk generally. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's a good thing. It, it, it is. Um, I just wonder now. Do you ever um, do you ever have a like a subtext or an underlying idea behind a story like this? I, I did. If you call it an underlying. Uh, Subtext, but I mean, the, 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 in *A Prince and a Spy*, the, the, one of the main aspects of it is the the uh, people trying to get word out about the Holocaust. They saw it happening in 1942. That's when it really started. I mean, of course, there've been great atrocities before that. We know that, but 1942 is when they set up the uh, the death camps in Treblinka. And Sobibor and, and Auschwitz, but, and there were there were people trying to get word out. Some very very brave people, uh, and that's what I'm. That, that is what the focus of what's happening in in my book. Um, you know, Britain and America did hear about the Holocaust in 1942. Uh, which is three years before the end of the war, which is when most people think they found out about what was happening in the camps. They knew that in '42. The problem was they couldn't do anything about it, uh, and that's why it wasn't publicised that much because it would have made them look helpless, I suppose, which they were. I mean, there were people in 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 Poland who were, were desperate for the Allies to bomb these camps. They thought it was better to bomb them and bomb the train lines, taking people to them, than that they should be left to carry on their evil work. Yeah. Anyway, that's the subtext, subtext, if you like, but it's not really a subtext. It's sort of quite central to the whole story. Right, right. So it must be. It must be strange. It, it certainly is to me to see the people that um, are out there denying the Holocaust ever even ever happened. Well, nowadays, yeah, it's, it, it doesn't make sense, does it? Yeah, and, uh, I mean, you know, that's that's why Eisenhower insisted on going into. Uh, uh, I'm not sure which camp he was. Was it Buchenwald? He was. He, he visited and he went in and he saw all the bodies. He said, "I've got to go in here because I've got to be able to tell the world because we, it will will come a time when people deny this happened, and I want to be able to say this happened, and it, you know, he knew it happened, and." It it happened. So the, the Holocaust denial started straight after the war. Actually, there were people start saying, "Oh, it's all uh, it's all lies." Put about it, it wasn't anywhere near as bad as that. All the damage was did these camps was caused by the Allied bombing. I mean, there were people saying that straight away. Man, it's just it's just crazy uh, to see the way things go. Um, the, the the history and stuff and and that um and even with the covid now and stuff and see how people um almost want to deny it you know uh, yeah yeah but a lot of people get it i mean my, my daughter's just had it you know she's okay fortunately but other friends of ours have had it and uh, uh haven't, haven't done well um yeah yeah yes i mean i don't know why they deny it they must be they must see it around them yeah yeah, it's just it's, it's it's kind of a craziness going on, but um, well, yeah. interesting. So, um, and and who do you who would be your favorite 
writer? My favorite writer of uh, fiction, yeah, uh, of thriller, of thrillers, and uh, uh, you know, one of the, my favorite ones is William William Goldman. Actually, I think he's a fantastic writer. You know, Marathon Man. That's one of my all time favorite thrillers. Freddy Forsyth, the Day of the Jackal, and the Odessa File. Um, yeah, there's, there's been some. Uh, James Elroy, he's really good. I mean, I, just, I think there's some great... There have been some great writers. An awful lot of ones... I, I, read, I do read a lot of thrillers, and uh, a lot of them, I think they're not as good, but there are some really, really good ones. I always, as a kid, I always loved James Bond books, I've got to say. Yeah. <laughs> they looked a bit... I tried, I tried reading one again recently. It looked a bit dated. It, didn't, it wasn't quite as thrilling as I remembered it. I think I was really keen on the... Fantastically, fantastic covers they had on the books, actually, more than anything in those days. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what it happens, you know. The, the covers will sell. Yeah. You know, it's uh... they too. They were great covers, and Raymond Chandler, he was good. Uh, Robert Harris, I like at the moment. Um, yeah, some good writers around. I mean, that, those are thrillers. Of course, I do. I've, I've read plenty of non-thrillers as well, but I do. I am a, a thriller-loving guy, got to say. Well, in the same vein, do you have any influences, uh, whether it's film or, or, or uh, writers or uh, anything that uh, that might surprise fans? I guess, uh, you know, it, uh, funny, uh, when I was a teenager, I would really, really like romantic women's fiction. I'm mean, talking about historical mm-hmm. fiction. I don't know if you've ever heard a book called uh, uh, about Anya Seaton's uh, book, Catherine, it, but that was a great English uh, bit of historical fiction. Uh, and, you know, it must have seemed very strange to people who knew me to see me read it, devouring these historical <laughs> novels written by women. But I did like them. <laughs> but I also, but I say I also like James Bond as well. And I like comics too. <laughs> I, always, I always like comics. I think comics are really good because they... They, in a very few words, they've got to tell a story, and I like that. You know, you've got mm. to. They, you don't hang around. You get straight down to the story, then you the action. Yeah, that's if, 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 you know, if, if I've read a couple of pages of a book and it hasn't interested in me, I'm not going to stick with it. I've got to get. Uh, they've got to catch my interest straight away, and I try and do that with my books. I want to catch the reader's interest straight away and hold it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, well, that's that's true. Uh, so. Now, um, how do people get a hold of you? You have a website or a location that you like to connect with your fans. I've got, I've got a website, uh, RoryClements dot com, uh, or, or RoryClements dot co dot uk. Same thing. Uh, and uh, I've got a readers club that you can join and get messages through. Um, yeah, I've got to get a link up there so mm. people can email email me. But uh, they can certainly get into my readers club, and that's. Uh, very very uh, easygoing uh, affair, which has got a few thousand members, and I just every now and then I just let them know what's going on in my, with my research or a new book coming out. I don't bombard you every week or even every month with uh, with uh, information. Oh, too bad. <laughs> <laughs> like more emails, you know. Yeah. Do, do, do you, I just one? I have this one question. Do you think that? Um, the history of that time period over the the Nazi regime and all the things that went on, um, do you think it's portrayed quite well in Hollywood, so to speak, in movies and, and series that you see around? Uh, it can be, yeah. I mean, I think that probably one of the greatest films ever made was Schindler's List, wasn't it? I, mean, I, mm. just, I went to watch that at the cinema when it first came out, and... It's what's about four hours long, isn't it? I think. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's very, very long film. Mm. And I sat in the cinema, and you couldn't hear anything. The audience were absolutely silent from the word go. There was no, you wouldn't, you didn't hear a cough, nothing. It held the, it held the audience right from the word go, and uh, was an incredible bit of filmmaking, I thought. And uh, you know he's done other great work. I like Saving Private Ryan and Ryan, that uh, battle scene on the beaches of Normandy is mm-hmm. incredible. Yeah, 
Um, I like. I've got to say, I do have a soft spot for uh, uh, Quentin Tarantino and Inglorious Bastards, <laughs> or however you pronounce it. Yeah. I did. I I did like. That. Yeah, I really did. Yeah, yeah. I think he does well. You know, it's uh, yeah. It's certainly an interesting uh, time period, and I'm sure there's more stories to come. You know, from it. And uh, do you plan on staying in there's, in this area for a while? There. Are, there I think there are as many stories as there are people in the world, aren't there, in, from the world? Or yeah. Everyone's mm. ever had a story. Yeah. I wonder, do you think that the, um, do you think people um, today are growing distant to the to the war, World War Two, and don't really know what went on in the younger generations, do you think? Well, I don't know. I mean, my publisher was... was had a book called The Tattooist of Auschwitz. I don't know if you've heard of that. But that sold you know, millions around the world. And it's done fantastically well. So yeah, you'd think that there must be uh, still fascination by it. Because they, I mean, they were uniquely evil, weren't they, the Nazis? I mean, they were, I mean there'd been plenty of massacres and holocausts around the world, but there was something uniquely deranged about the Nazis and they mm. and they and you know the, the dark I mean it's been talked about Hitler's dark charisma but he was charismatic women loved him I mean he, he got he was elected because of, he got the women's vote because the women had had the vote in in Germany for a long time by then and they uh, there were far more women in Germany in 1930 than there were men because so many men had died in the war first world war so he absolutely was adored by women. It really is strange that glamour, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The power, I guess. The uh... I mean, he didn't exactly look like a movie star either, did no, he? I mean, he didn't, no, no. And it, didn't he? He didn't. He didn't look like Brad Brad Pitt or anything. No, and I, and, he, <laughs> and I heard he had bad gas and was vegetarian. So <laughs> he, I think uh, it, that's true. Yeah. yeah. He, did, he was a veggie. Yeah, well, there yeah. you go. So, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. He was the idol of the ladies back then, I guess. So. He was. Mm. Yeah. Well, this has uh, been a great interview. We love talking about history, and we got we had an expert. Um, today we've been featuring the book A Prince and a Spy, and it's a novel. And uh, our guest has been the author, Rory Clements. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. My pleasure, Al. Thank you. Thanks, Rory. Tired of wasting time trying to decide what to watch on your streaming service? Go to our website and look for the Martino Movie Reviews. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. <laughs> has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you. If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.